Welcome to RHI Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today we are here with Michael Toscano, professional mixologist and brand ambassador, Woodford Reserves. Hey, Michael, great to have you uh, with me today doing this interview. I'm excited about our conversation. I, I think you're going to add a lot to the whole understanding of, of, of the field and the evolution of mixology. Um, so why not give me a little bit of background, like where are you from and, and what, what was your early life that led you to doing what you're doing? Sure. Uh, so my name is Michael Toscano. Uh, I'm a brand ambassador for Woodford Reserve uh, here in New York City, uh, but I have an extensive background in craft cocktails uh, in the cocktail world. Um, I'm actually in New York by way of Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and my, my career was actually a little bit backwards. I graduated from college in 2005 and spent most of my 20s in corporate America uh, doing sales, uh, nine to five, uh, B2B sales. Uh, and then in my late 20s, uh, I decided that I didn't want to do it anymore, that the beverage industry, food and beverage hospitality uh, was something I really identified with, uh, the hours I identified with. It was just the lifestyle that I wanted. Um, and my brothers and I had the idea of opening a bar one day. And um, one's an occupational therapist and one's a graphic designer. So with the business background, it made sense that I would need to, to be the one running it. So I, I literally stopped uh, corporate America completely, took a job at a local uh, craft uh, brewery called Sun King in Indianapolis, canning beer in the mornings. And then I answered a Facebook ad for a cocktail bar called Libertine Liquor Bar uh, and took a job as a bar back and just figured if I was going to do this, I had to start from the ground up because uh, I knew really nothing about the business. And, uh, and that was 29 years old, uh, getting ready to be 30. And, uh, and then it kind of just took off from there. Um, I moved up within Libertine from Babarback to uh, general manager over a three year period. And then met my wife, got married, we moved to New York. Uh, I started working at a bar called Dante in the West Village, which is a world renowned cocktail program. Uh, and then about two years into that, Woodford came calling and it was a great opportunity to to kind of take two careers and, and put them together and, and become a brand ambassador. So uh, that's a very 30,000 foot view, I guess, of, uh, <laughs> of how I ended up where I am today here in Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. Well, Brooklyn's the hotspot of uh, creativity in New York. Huh? <laughs> um, so, so from your perspective uh, and looking at this from those early days in Indianapolis to where you are today, how have you seen the whole bartending mixology world change? I know we talked before we started this call that, you know, I, I go back, you know, 40 years to uh, my experience as a bartender. And it was really a pretty simple, you know, put a shot in the glass and, and put a garnish on it. <clears throat> or you had three beers, you know, Miller, Miller Coors and, uh, and Bud uh, and Heineken as your import. But today the the world of, of mixology and bartending has changed dramatically. So, so from your own personal experience and the, and the work you've done with other people in the field, uh, how, how have you seen it evolve? Well, I mean, definitely first, you know, early on in, in Indianapolis, when I started, you know, we were, that's when the craft cocktail scene was really starting to hit in the Midwest. And so there was, you know, every night those shifts were explaining to people what simple syrup was and what bitters were and, you know, more than just a vodka soda and, you know, and the, the craftsmanship that went into it, why it took three minutes for a cocktail versus just, a, you know, uh, something off of a soda gun. So there was obviously a ton of education that came in, in, on the forefront. Um, but with that also came, you know, I think we have to own uh, a little bit of the, the theme and the, the, the piece of like the, the exclusivity that came with mixology at the beginning, I think was something that we all battled, right? The, the vest and the tie and the tattoos and, you know, that whole look. And then, um, you know, it intimidated a lot of people. And, and I think we, we have understood over time the importance of uh, presenting an accepting experience for everyone to come in and be a part of that. And so I think with that comes um, a lot of these new trends, right? We're talking about uh, non-alcohol cocktails. We're talking about um, vodka sodas being on a menu, right? I think for a long time, vodka was kind of the, the black sheep of the craft cocktail world. Um, and now you're seeing bartenders start to really embrace that. And then as you get to, you know, I get to New York, we're still having some of those conversations, but we have definitely seen 
Um, and even going back to Indianapolis, when I go to visit family, I mean, consumers understand what the experience is. They understand what an old fashioned is, what Manhattans are, um, you know, gin and tonics, you know, we're talking about the Spanish really did a great job of creating this beautiful experience with the gin and tonic where you're taking a two ingredient cocktail and elevating it with garnishes and aromatics and the presentation of drinks. And, you know, we saw that a lot at Dante. It was everything was done beautifully, right? The wash lines were perfect. The garnishes were perfect. No matter who was making your drink, whether it was 11 o'clock in the morning for a brunch cocktail or two in the morning for a, a nightcap, you know, they always looked the same. The execution and expectation was always set that way. So I think that um, you're definitely seeing that as, as a trend and people are trying to find ways to elevate um, these cocktails and, and also make them approachable um, for the common consumer that maybe um, is having their old fashioned for the very first time. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that that's, it's been fun to see that industry go from a very niche close knit group to being more accepting and definitely more of a mainstream, um, you know, expectation across the board. So uh, you, you see uh, in, in a way, what I, what I hear you saying, you know, is, is, is what, what has been a traditional cocktail has been enhanced with uh, kind of external features like your gin and tonic you said with different garnishes and stuff it's, it's it's like a hamburger is no longer just a hamburger anymore it's it's sure. a, it's a it's a creation yeah <clears throat> and uh the same thing is true an old fashioned is not just an old fashioned anymore so how do you think people are changing how they drink with this now not just the craft cocktail but the craft beers and the and the, the wines really kind of led that specialization you know that localized uh, regional product and support local and you know that movement to the the understanding the soil and the and then understanding how to taste uh, wine differently and and so that kind of tra transferred to the beer movement in my opinion and then the craft movement and uh, mixology kind of followed suit so but how has the consumer's drinking patterns changed in, in your opinion? And where do they fit in terms of craft beer, craft wine, craft uh, spirits, drinks, and then now you have craft ciders and all of these other products. Um, what, what's driving the consumer and how are they drinking differently? I mean, I think the consumer is pushing the industry. You know, I think that the consumer challenges us to to find more creative ways to um, deliver, you know, those experiences, right? I think everybody remembers the first time they had a big clear ice cube in the old fashioned. Well, now it's okay, great. So what's the next thing, right? How do we continue to engage with the consumer? You know, they're coming in and looking to be wowed, right? I mean, you look at uh, once again, like Dante, the, the Garibaldi is a two ingredient cocktail. It's orange juice and Campari. Uh, but by peeling the oranges and putting it through a Breville juicer, it creates this fluffy texture. And, you know, it's presented in a way with this beautiful orange wedge on top. So it's visually captivating as well as delicious. And it gives them a different experience. And I think when you look at craft beer, I mean, look at wine. You talked about it, right? With orange wines and natural wines being a thing that's really boomed. And you're, and you're pushing that. The local breweries, I think, did a great job. Um, you know, Sun King was one of the first ones in Indianapolis that really started to create different variations versus just, uh, you know, an ale or a lager or, you know, you know, you're getting into gozes and stouts and porters and what, what's an oyster stout about, you know, and all of those things that can kind of really like, you know, you just create new and new opportunities for people to come in. I, I also look at like what I was doing five, six, seven, eight years ago is the standard now. You know what I mean? And there are, there are younger people coming up underneath me that are creating things that I would have never been able to think about, right? And that, that is coming from what consumers are asking for. As much as it's coming from the, the craftsmanship, you know, of our industry and people that are looking for ways to innovate, um, put their stamp, you know, their mark on the industry and how can they take something that's a, a standard or an expectation and then elevate it to the next level. And so, and I think that's just going to continue, um, you know, to be a trend, you know, as, as we move forward. I don't, you know, I feel like, very, very rarely do things stay the same for very long, uh, and especially in industry, uh, you know, where we're constantly looking for ways to to generate experience. Because we're all, you know, every bar, every restaurant, every brewery, every distillery, we're all looking, you know, to capture that same piece of the pie, right? So mm -hmm. how do we how do we elevate ourselves and, and create an experience that that's going to, you know, lure the consumer in and 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 get them to become loyal to, to that product? 
One of the important lessons I learned years ago was from a bar manager and a, a restaurant bar owner in Monterey, California. And, and he said, you know, I'm not in the business of selling drinks because people could get the same Budweiser beer anywhere they go. He said, I'm renting real estate and people come to my establishment because of my staff, because of my, the way I maintain my premise and how clean it is. And, and also, you know, the products that I produce and I sell. So he said, people are buying an experience. They're not buying a drink. So I hear that's what you're saying too, right? That, that I'm not just going in and getting an old fashioned, I'm getting a show. I'm getting to watch a bartender go through the steps that it takes to make the drink that I ordered. And, and then I have to talk about the ingredients and I have to talk about the methodology. And, mm -hmm. and, and so these are all kind of the things that I, I envision is what's happening too, you know, that, that it, it, you're, you're almost like an entertainer. Yeah, I had, I had somebody tell me early on in my career that a, that a guest is tasting the cocktail the minute they walk into the door of your establishment to the minute that they leave, right? It's not just when they get the drink in front of them. And, and I think looking at, you know, looking, I mean, look at um, the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky, right? I mean, 20 years ago, what, how many visitor centers were there? How many real experiences were there? How many tours were happening? I think you, the, the craft breweries that have these, you know, giant tap rooms now, and they've got a kitchen and they serve food and it's an experience for the family. And you can come spend the day at the brewery or the distillery or the winery and make it more of, more of that. And so, you know, I definitely think those are, those are definitely clear examples of, as an industry, we're understanding that it's more than just what's in the glass. It's the experience that comes with that. And I think consumers are, they expect that they want to, they want to see, you know, when I do trainings and tastings on Woodford, when I can give people insight into the brand or how we create a product or, you know, that peek behind the curtain, you will, that Wizard of Oz moment, um, you know, those are things that, that are kind of expected now. And so you've got to mm -hmm. be able to find ways to cultivate that experience, um, no matter what business you're in when it comes to hospitality, because everyone else is looking for that, that way, you know. Now, obviously, you know, whether it's, it's beer or wine or spirits, alcohol is an ingredient and alcohol is a, what I call a lubricant of sociability. You know, it, 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 it loosens us up so that we're uh, more engaging and more interactive. But there comes a time where too much alcohol moves you into a position of being argumentative or disruptive or even violent in some cases. And, and so the bartender's role and the mixologist's role it kind of goes beyond just the art form, uh, unlike uh, a, a chef, for instance, where the food doesn't necessarily cause a person to change their behavior. And, and so how do you feel that, that um, the shift of appreciating the beverage more than just drinking to get the effect is making it easier for bartenders to, to monitor and manage or are people just drinking less because the quality of what they're buying is better and obviously the price point is higher. Sure. I mean, how do you feel the whole responsible beverage service field is, is, is evolving in terms of the responsibilities of monitoring and intervening with patrons? For, I can speak on my behalf, right, on this for sure, in the sense of that I, you know, you become very aware very quickly when you're serving craft cocktails and, you know, ounce and a half or two ounce pours of a high proof spirit. Um, there is a lot of education that goes into that, right? Consumers, especially early on, didn't quite understand the effect that, you know, having three old fashions was going to have, you know, versus what they were drinking traditionally, you know, and maybe a chain restaurant or at, at a nightclub. And so there's definitely a lot of that education. Um, you know, bartenders are trained on that. There is a lot of, you know, tip certification and, and a lot of those things that uh, I know that a lot of restaurants I worked at, those were requirements. So you had to go through that, that training process. Um, I don't know that I see so much in the craft cocktail world that, I, that I've noticed people coming in just to, you know, slam, you know, Negronis or, uh, you know, Manhattans to, to get intoxicated more than maybe it's one or two um, to get the night started or to end the night. That's not to say that there aren't cases where as a bartender, you've got to be a little bit more cognizant of obviously what you're doing, who you're serving, how many you're serving. Um, you know, there have been instances where understanding to maintain calm and, and you know, not elevate a situation further than it has to be. Um, 
you know, I think that there's always opportunities for things to go wrong when alcohol is involved, right? If you're not cognizant and aware mm-hmm. of what you're doing. So, um, but I don't know that it's um, anything that's, you know, handled any differently from uh, a nightclub to a craft cocktail bar. I think it's, that's part of the training that we all go through uh, when we get started. And, you know, obviously as we get into outdoor seating, as we get into, you know, New York has outdoor seating for the first time ever, and it's going to be, you know, permanent, you know, street side, seating and so you're you have a whole other element there um when it comes to serving because you just a lot of places have doubled or tripled their capacity with that space um and then getting the staff involved to make sure that we're you know we're staying as responsible as we can mm-hmm. now um covid has certainly changed things like you said with the outdoor dining but another big uh, feature of trying to help restaurants in particular stay open was the you know if I ordered a, a dinner I could order my my favorite cocktail, mm-hmm. um, and so you had the cocktails to go, or in some cases, you would get a kit and you would be able to make your own drink. I mean, how do you and other people who kind of look at this as an art form uh, view this kind of packaging of a drink and just sending it out in a plastic container for people to consume at home? Do you think it dampens the whole art form of the drink or do you think it's a good thing that people can get samples? I mean, I'm not gonna get that clear um, clear ball of ice in my drink, you know, sure. or that uh, custom carved orange uh, on, on the glass. So do you think it, 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 is it a good thing that it's happening or do you think it's, it's a, is it just something that's temporary and that consumers may not really wanna continue to do it? Uh, so I think it's a good thing. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, you know, I, 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 part of me has to acknowledge that, you know, being able to give somebody an old fashioned kit, you know, they're basic cocktails that are in these to go kits too. It's not, you know, you're not going to get a four or five ingredient cocktail with shrubs and, you know, all that. Those, there are certain things you're still only going to be able to get at a restaurant, but I do love the idea of being able to empower somebody to say, Hey, here's a kit. Here's all the ingredients. Here's a step-by-step flyer on how to make an old fashioned at home or Manhattan or, or something like that. So I, I think that's fantastic. Um, and it, one, I, two, I think it also, consumers are going to take that home and understand that it probably still doesn't taste as good as it does in a restaurant because mm-hmm. there's something about having it prepared for you uh, by a professional and in that atmosphere that just makes it taste different. Um, so, but, but I also think that, you know, giving people that education and showing them kind of what it takes to make those kind of cocktails and the, the thought and the effort that goes into those things. I've seen restaurants that are doing, you know, they'll do an old fashioned with their own spin on the syrup, right? And they'll explain how they're making the flavored syrups or their own bitters and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think that any opportunity you have to educate a consumer on, on the process and what goes into it, and then also being able to empower them to be able to create some of their own, I think is, is neat because then they get to come back and share their experience and talk to you about what they learned and kind of what they think. And then that also creates this great opportunity to have that dialogue, um, you know, with the guest about like what they like, what they don't like, and then curating something else. And then maybe the next time around that's unique to their preferences, but that they maybe didn't even understand they had until they took that kid home and played with it. So um, I, I'm all for it. I think that it's a, it's a fun way to engage and um, maybe kind of give them a peek once again, another, you know, behind the curtain kind of moment. Yeah. of the thought process that goes into creating a cocktail like that for them when they're in the establishment. Well, yeah. well you know, that happened last night with my wife because, uh, you know, she would, she would drink gin and tonics at home and she'd make them and she got the, the Venus gin, you know, from the local distillery and she'd read the recipes and everything. But when we went out last night, like I told you, you know, <clears throat> came with the juniper berries and the rosemary and the, you know, all this kind of specialty ingredients and everything. And she was surprised that how long it lasted her, you know, because <clears throat> it was almost like it, she should savor it more than drink it, you know? And, and I think that that was an interesting observation, which is what you're saying. You don't get that same opportunity when it comes delivered to your home that you would if you were in the establishment having it made for you. Right. And like you said, the experience of that drink begins, especially if you've had it prepared that way before you go back just to get it. And I think that's something that you brought up too is, is and this is one thing I learned because I went to a mixology school back in 1972, but you know, just measuring everything um, because what, what we were instructed to say, look, 
when a customer comes in and they order a, a scotch on the rocks or a scotch and soda, they want it to taste the same every time. Mm -hmm. And if you free pour, if you don't measure it, sometimes it'll be stronger and sometimes it'll be weaker and they're not getting that same experience, you know? And I see that today that a lot of uh, mixologists measure everything, you know, everything mm -hmm. is proportionate, it's measured, even the non-alcoholic ingredients are all measured. So you, 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 you see that as another important, not only cost control for the establishment, Sure. Because they can predict in advance, you know, what their poor, what their, what their inventory control is, uh, because everything is properly measured. But, but, but do you think that consistency is really what distinguishes a, a bartender from a mixologist? I, I, I don't know that I would say a bartender from a mixologist. I would just say, you know, a, a consistency is what distinguishes quality from not quality. You know, I think there's quality bartenders out there, like there's quality, you know, I, mean, I think mixology Mixologists and bartenders to me are the same, right? Mm -hmm. I just think that mixology prepares you for an expectation that it's going to be, you know, maybe real juice, right? Instead of out of a gun, you know what I mean? Or like you're going to maybe have that gin and tonic with the juniper berries and the rosemary versus a gin and tonic and a highball with a twist of lemon, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's the same, it's the same job. But I do think when you look at quality bar programs, when you, when you look at the ones that are the craft cocktail bars that are, you know, notarized, you know, getting not notarization, notoriety, notoriety is the word, uh, you know, around the world, it's because, you know, like, I, I'm going to keep harking on Dante, because that's my experience. But, you know, the Negroni was in one rocks glass, there were three cold draft ice cubes, it was a wedge of orange cut the exact same way, right to the same line on the rocks glass. The old fashioned had a different rocks glass with a different piece of ice mm -hmm, with a different mm -hmm. stamp on it, right? There were different Collins glasses, there were different wine glasses. So, yeah. like, and it was down to, you know, the Garibaldi you do in a tiny highball with two cold draft ice cubes. You do the Campari, then the orange juice, you give it a little flip, you add the other ice, then you top it with orange juice, then you set the orange on top. Then, it, you know, what I mean, like, it was broke down to that level of that level of detail. Yeah, I yes, remember. Absolutely. I remember you know, the wash on had to hit a certain level on the coupe. And a yeah. certain level on the sidecar for the Manhattan, you know, so like, those are the things that, you know, I think that's what you what you want when you go to a, when you go to a bar and you're paying, you know, you're having that experience. And I think that's the thing that the to go cocktails, as much as they're, you know, they're wonderful, but that's the thing you can't replicate, yeah, right? When you go home understand. and you've got, you know, your, your Chicago Cubs pint glass, and that's all you have, right? For your cocktail, it's not going to taste the same as it does in that specific rocks glass with the ice and the stamp and the, you know, the, the curated orange wedge that has, you know, the craft scissors with the little bubbles. On, you know, like that's the stuff that <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah, that makes it you know, special. I, I, I you remember, know, yeah, you know, like I said, when I first got into the bartending world, there was a glass for everything, and the glass size was proportionate to the alcohol content. You mm -hmm. know. So your sherry glass was smaller than your, you know, your wine glass and your, yep. and your martini glass. You know, when you look at the original martini glass, it was three ounces, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and today you get martini glasses, you know, that are just like huge. And, and I think that, that the proportionality was related to the uh, alcohol content in terms of the size of the glass. I just want to conclude, uh, because uh, we've gone a little bit older, but over, but it's, it's, it's a great conversation. We could go on forever, but, but, you know, if, if we were to have this conversation 18 months from now, one of the things that happened when we did the summit was, was there was the, the woman from the listen bar, you know, which mm -hmm. is a sober bar and that concept of a sober bar, not just having non-alcohol or what I call alcohol-free drinks on the menu, but a whole establishment that's dedicated to that where do you see the future of 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 everything that's going on 18 months from now what will the world look like huh. um uh, man 18 months from now i mean look at the end of the day you know like we talked about the the street uh dining in new york like that's here to stay that that's a permanent thing i think you'll see a lot more of an outdoor alfresco style of you know bars and restaurants out there i do think um, you know, even in the short amount of time with this non-alcoholic boom, you're seeing more and more restaurants are including non-alcoholic options within the menu, not just on the back page, uh, you know, listed as the last option. We talked about 
you know, the veto vote, you know, the, when you're out with a group of people and I'm somebody like, I, I don't drink and I'm also a vegetarian. Right. So I'm, I check two boxes there. <laughs> um, so when I go out with people or when I go out for work, it's, you know, where can we go that I can find something to eat? And there's a, there's an option for me to enjoy something besides, you know, a soda water, uh, with a twist of lemon or lime. And so, you know, I do think you'll see some more exclu in inclusivity within the cocktail programs, within the food programs. I think, you know, the, the word is out on that. Um, you know, I, we talk about, obviously there'll be more people at work. I think every bar and restaurant I go to right now, there's a lot of, everyone is looking for, for people to come work New York. A lot of people left New York and didn't come back. So there's already this, 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 this void here with, with, with people that are looking for work there as well. Um, so I'm assuming we'll be back to, to full bore in 18 months, but I think in a more inclusive way. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, which will be nothing but beneficial for the, for the businesses too, because if the more, the more you can include in your business, right. As far as on the menu, the, just the more opportunity you have to capture sales and, and more loyalty from the consumers that live in your market. So mm -hmm. this has been fascinating. I'm sure we could have gone on forever, but Absolutely. I, I want to thank you for your time and uh, look forward to the, this conversation 18 months from now. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Thanks.